Good morning, everyone. As we have folks coming into the waiting room, just want to welcome you all here to the District 6 Budget Town Hall. We're going to give folks a, a chance to gather and join, and then we'll get started momentarily. Okay, are you guys able to see the presentation? Coming across okay? Great. So it looks like we have about 31 participants so far and climbing, 32. Maybe we'll give one more minute, uh, a couple more minutes. So 10.05, we'll get started. Okay, so we are recording. We also are about to go live on Facebook. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Good morning, everybody. My name is Lauren Taylor. For those who I have not met yet, thank you for joining our District 6 Budget Town Hall. Uh, we have a lot of details uh, to cover today relative to the upcoming 2021 to 2023 fiscal year budget that is being has been proposed by the mayor and the city administrator and that the council will be deliberating over the next uh, six weeks uh, and approving a final budget for the next two years by June 30th. So before we jump into it, I would like to share with uh, with you a few announcements for District 6, uh, things that hopefully uh, you'll get some value in. So first of all, District 6, we have this Sunday, tomorrow, our Acoma Outdoor Market. Want to encourage everybody to come out, check out the market, support local vendors, uh, and get some healthy food, other resources that will be available. Uh, my office has office hours every Acoma Market, uh, first and third Sundays. So if you'd like to schedule one-on-one -on -one time, to discuss any issues in District 6, please do that as well. Also, this week, the 18th and 19th, Frick United is having a vaccine clinic, a pop-up vaccine clinic. So we are doing great in Alameda County in terms of more than 70% of Alameda County residents have their, at least their first dose of the vaccine, and more than 54% of Alameda County residents are fully vaccinated. So good news on the progress, but we still have a ways to go. So I want to encourage those who are not vaccinated to do so. 
Also upcoming this Wednesday, May 19th, you, uh, we are having a town hall on District 6 developments. There are three developments we will be focusing on in that town hall, providing an overview of what's happening, what's being uh, sort of in development with some uh, properties. Also, we have um, a warehouse and logistics facility that's being that is being uh, presented. And lastly, we uh, we have the Edward Shands complex that Oakland Unified School District is developing. Uh, and so we want to provide those updates, have a chance for community to ask questions. The mental health awareness and resource fair we are hosting on May 23rd, uh, this upcoming Sunday, May 23rd, is another event that we want everyone to be aware of, a free event. Mental health and is so critical to our community. We want to make sure that everyone is uh, able to benefit uh, from the resources that exist, know what's out there, and be able to live happier, healthier uh, lives. And so we're partnering with a number of organizations that are listed here. And lastly, we have an amazing uh, Sustainable Urban Design Academy at Castlemont High School. And our students have uh, gone over the past semester and developed proposals for how we can develop a portion of the Coliseum site. And so we wanna support them as they give their final presentations on May 27th. So the agenda for today, we will be, so the agenda for today, actually, let me pause. I wanna make sure that everyone's able to see the slides that are here. Um, team, I'm seeing some text messages coming across. Is there something that we need to do differently relative to presenting? Not hearing anything, we'll go ahead and continue. So the agenda for today is we want to, uh, we're doing this welcome, brief announcements, providing some context, and then we will quickly be shifting to uh, the presentation of the proposed budget. And that we'll be looking to our finance team to provide that presentation, the process for developing the budget, key changes from prior years that we want to highlight. We have asked them to specifically identify some of the things that are important uh, for District 6 and will have an impact in our part of the district. And then lastly, how to navigate the budget website. This year, in addition to having a PDF uh, flat file of the budget, the proposed budget, we have a very interactive website that provides unique views. And so we want to make sure that uh, folks know how to uh, navigate the website as such. We also, um, then we'll go into the capital improvement project. So capital is different from the expenses uh, and how we, how we manage the uh, um, other aspects of the budget. And so we've gone through a, an extensive process to prioritize how capital dollars get invested. So we'll hear from our Oakland Public Works and Department of Transportation uh, on that. And then we will wrap up with about a half an hour to 45 minutes of live Q&A uh, as, as um, attendees would like. And so that's what we have lined up for today. I wanna thank those who are here to help present and share this information and thank all of you for being here to participate. Uh, before turning it over to our finance team, I do want to thank those on the line as well as those who have participated in various aspects of providing input to our um, budget prioritization process. Uh, you'll see here a number of inputs, direct interactions with District 6 residents through emails, phone calls, one-on-one -on -one meetings, office hours. We've also had a number of neighborhood and community meetings attending uh, neighborhood councils. Uh, and listening to the priorities, the concerns, the opportunities that have been highlighted there. We've been looking at our 311 requests, other service requests across uh, District 6 and across the city. Um, we conducted a District 6 budget survey where we used Thought Exchange platform in order to hear from folks and have uh, scoring of different ideas that folks represented. And lastly, uh, we've had a number of conversations with key community partners, community groups that are either based in District 6 or serving the District 6 uh, residents and community. So uh, that, those are all the inputs that we factored in. Um, and just to provide some additional insight, we have 
um, here's the survey that we conducted. We had more than 240 thoughts or ideas and almost 4,000 ratings of those thoughts and ideas. And you'll see here the word cloud that shows the words that most frequently came up when folks were adding their thoughts or contributing to the thoughts of others. Okay, sorry, uh, Lauren, are you, are you presenting your slides now? Yes. I wanna put it in presentation mode. Okay, thank you. Cool. Um, also want to identify, uh, just wanted to highlight here that we've got uh, the major themes that came out of our presentation, uh, the, the, the survey. So uh, from left to right, those that got the higher scores, we have crime, keeping the city clean, aspects of blight, beautification, uh, street repair, actually maintaining the infrastructure across the district and across the city as a whole. We've got uh, an enforcement of traffic, uh, support for parks, illegal dumping, beautification, homelessness, uh, quality of life, and food slash stores, access to healthy food and sto uh, stores in the district and in East Oakland. And so those are the top themes that emerged. You'll see this is, we don't have time to read all of the uh, thoughts and ideas that were added, but here's some highlights from the top three themes crime, city cleanliness and beautification and then street repair. And so sorry, just, council, council members, sorry, we're please. not, people are, are, are putting messages. We're not seeing any of your slides except for the first one. Okay, let me try and uh, shift PowerPoint. This. Okay, let's try this again. I'm going to, thank you for that. Okay, we're gonna. Okay, can you guys see? Can you guys see that? Yes. Hello? Yep. Yes, and we haven't seen any of the others, just so you know. Haven't seen any other slides. Okay, apologies for that, everyone. Um, the technical difficulties. Um, here, I'm going to go back and just uh, quickly see. So these are the announcements, the slides, just for those who want to go back in the recording, you'll be able to see that. The announcements that I spoke about, um, here's the development town hall, the mental health resource fair, and the SUDA uh, design showcase, our Castlemont students. I'm going to stop here, spend a little bit more time on the agenda, uh, just so that folks can see the welcome and brief announcements. We will have the overview of the mayor's uh, proposed budget, followed by our capital improvement projects process, the live Q&A, and then a closing wrap up. And I'm going to, there you go. Hopefully that's, uh, you're able to see still. Um, this is the inputs that we received to the budget prioritization process are um, the various inputs that you and others across the district have contributed to. And then uh, a few summary slides of the survey. So we've got the um, 241 thoughts that have been contributed, almost 4,000 ratings of those thoughts. And then the word cloud that shows the, uh, the words that frequently were mentioned through this process. And I think this is where uh, I was, this is showing the themes that emerged through the survey. And so wanting to just highlight that these top themes, uh, which I read off earlier, how they were uh, stacked against each other. And then this slide represents the uh, some of the thoughts and the scoring of those thoughts for the highest themes. So um, hopefully we're caught up now on the slides that I thought were being presented, but weren't. So thank you for your patience and understanding everyone. Uh, and next, I wanted to share with you the budget priorities for District 6 and for the council that we aligned on. So based on the input that we received from uh, the various sources, on the left, you'll see the District 6 budget priorities. Uh, this is what I submitted in a memo to the council, to the mayor, 
city administration so that they can incorporate it into the proposed budget that we will be hearing and then also so that we can get alignment among council members as we go into uh, making uh, revisions, enhancements, additions to the budget that has been presented thus far. On the right, you'll see four key themes and through the council's, uh, through the council's budget deliberations and meetings around the themes, priorities, and our sort of off-site retreat, we were able to identify four key citywide priorities that we wanted to focus on as a council. And so that's what's lifted up here. And you'll hear from our finance team how they incorporated this information into uh, what they're presenting as far as the budget. Um, and I think that is, those were the opening slides that I wanted to present and introduce. Now, I would like to turn it over to our finance department to walk us through and introduce the uh, proposed budget for 21 to 23 fiscal year. And I believe Walter is going to be presenting. Walter, uh, the, the slide share is yours. Oh, I'm, I'm just doing, I'm driving the slides. Uh, who's presenting for finance? Okay. Aaron, Aaron will kick us off. Okay. So Walter's putting the slides up while Aaron's getting ready. Perfect. While we're waiting for Walter, I would like to say thank you for having us and thank you for giving us the opportunity to present the budget to uh, district. We um, appreciate being able to show all the good work that the city of Oakland is um, looking forward to doing. So today we'll um, provide you the 2021, I mean, 21, 23 proposed policy budget as presented by the mayor. Next slide, please. Throughout the presentation, um, we will provide you a budget timeline. We will um, discuss the economic impacts that have uh, impacted this budget and the projected revenues. We'll discuss the council priorities and the principles that are embedded in, the, in this budget. We'll review the budget balancing highlights how we were, have been able to balance this budget. We will review the expenditures and service impacts that are included in this budget, and then provide to you the budget process enhancements that are uh, incorporated within this document, and then give you an OpenGov tutorial. <clears throat> OpenGov is the web page that um, helps, helps you navigate through the budget. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, in terms of the timeline, we want to kind of remind everyone where we started. Um, last year, March 2020, there was a state of emergency declared due to the pandemic. Um, at that point, we uh, realized that there would be some shortfall as all of um, the world has changed. Um, and come June 2020, uh, when the council passes uh, a mid-cycle budget amendment, we anticipated that there was a budget shortfall and that budget shortfall was closed. A lot of our documentation will refer you to this mid-cycle budget amendment as a comparison oh, point. I'm sorry, I don't know if I if there was some interference or go right um, ahead. Someone was off mute. Okay. Um, following the June 2020, um, in September of 2020, we received CARES Act funding of about $37 million. Of that 37 million, we were able to give a majority to citizens um, for um, relief. Uh, some of it was kept in house to help with the budgetary constraints. December 2020, um, the city administrator's office took action um, to re further reduce the deficit that um, had, had been identified in the FY21 general purpose fund. Come January 21 of this fiscal year, of this calendar year, All of it. I'm um, ready, we began the ready to budget process. We uh, began the biennial budget process. Um, and at, at that point, we identified a projected deficit of $274 million. And that's the starting point for this budget. Um, in March 21, we received wonderful news that the federal government was going to provide the city of Oakland $192 million in 
<clears throat> excuse me, ARPA funding, of which um, in April 21, the council um, made an amendment to the budget to allocate 58 million of those ARPA funds to restore the emergency reserves and plug other funds. Um, in May 21, a few days ago, the mayor uh, released this proposed budget. And then that takes us to uh, today where we have council forums and the council deliberation and budget hearings for us to come to uh, an adoption of, um, of the proposed budget. Next slide, please. This biennial budget uh, amounts to about $3.8 billion over the two years, 1.9 billion in the first year, 1.8 billion in the second year. And we provide a comparison for you, the June 2020 mid-cycle of 1.7 billion. So there is a slight increase between um, the mid-cycle to this um, biennial year. Most of it is due to um, ARPA funding uh, to help us continue services and um, provide the things that you all expect. Next slide, please. Here, I'll turn it over to our budget administrator, Lisa Augustin. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Okay, so just in terms of our bu budget process at a high level, it can be broken down into two phases. So there's budget development, um, which starts with what we call the baseline budget which is essentially the prior year's budget rolled over with some adjustments to our projected revenues based on the latest economic information and updates to expenses like salary increases and benefit rates. The baseline provides us with a starting point and tells us whether we have a surplus or a deficit that we need to address. Then the administration collects community input through a budget priorities poll and at the mayor's budget summit. And she takes this in combination with the council priorities um, and the proposals submitted by departments to make decisions about what needs to be added or cut from the budget. That gets us to the proposed budget, which is what we're discussing today. The second phase is budget adoption. So once the mayor has released the proposed budget, it's now the council's responsibility to get the budget to adoption. And part of this is conducting these community forums collecting feedback and input from residents, and then amending the budget. And all of this will take place over the next month and a half and council will eventually adopt a budget by June 30. Next slide. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the economy and its impact on revenues. The COVID-19 uh, pandemic resulted in significant increases in unemployment and reductions in economic activity. According to the Economic Analysis and Recovery Report issued by the Oakland Chamber of Commerce, the unemployment rates in the city of Oakland stood at 8.4% in February 2021, which is 4.8 percentage points higher than it was the same time last year. However, the labor market is recovered somewhat from the recession low of a 17% unemployment rate. The COVID-19 induced recession resulted in significant declines in several revenue sources, including sales tax, business license tax, transient occupancy tax, and parking related revenues. Due to the swift, swift and negative impact of the pandemic on ongoing tax revenues, the proposed budget while balanced is structurally imbalanced as one-time revenues are being used to fund ongoing expenses. So really in, a, in an ideal world, ongoing revenues would be sufficient to fund ongoing expenses. Next slide. A large percentage of our revenues come from property taxes. And thankfully, this source has stayed pretty steady throughout this recession and is expected to grow from an estimated 244 million in the current fiscal year to 250 million in year one and 270 million in year two of the budget. Sales tax was impacted. As you can see, there is a dip in the fiscal year 1920 and fiscal year 2021, but it is expected to grow to 87.3 million in year one and 98.5 million in year two, surpassing pre-COVID levels. Next slide. Transient occupancy tax or the hotel tax took a really big hit with steep declines in travel and tourism. However, in the proposed budget, the transient occupancy tax revenues are forecasted to grow 97% in year one and 23.17% in year two, which is still a negative 37% less the, than the revenue high of fiscal year 1819. 
Business license tax revenue is expected to grow from an estimated 88 million in fiscal year 2021 to a 92.7 million in year one um, and 94.3 million in year two. Next slide. And then real estate transfer tax um, took a dip, um, but still a little bit steady. It's expected to grow from an estimated 93.3 million in fiscal year 2021 to 94.6 million in year one and 98.3 million in year two. Next slide. So as Aaron mentioned, we received news in March that we are getting 192 million from the American Rescue Plan Act. Unlike the aid that we received from the CARES Act, which we received earlier last year, this funding is much more flexible and can be used to backfill revenue loss caused by COVID. We're going to receive half of that funding this year and half next year and all must be spent in 2024. Next slide. Just last month, council took action to balance the current year's deficit and use 58 million of the ARPA allocation, leaving 133 million to help balance the two-year budget. So we started with a $274 million all funds deficit, less the 133 million in ARPA monies. We're left with a $140 million gap. Next slide. So we were able to balance this budget by continuing to free some of the positions that were frozen in the mid cycle, implementing strategic reorganizations and reductions, transferring between funds where eligible and using unspent and unallocated fund balance from prior fiscal years. This resulted in a proposed budget that includes, oh, next slide, sorry. So this resulted in a proposed budget that includes the preservation of city jobs, reinstates the city's prudent fiscal policies, where we begin to build back up our reserves and pay down our debt. We also create a separate fund for the emergency reserve as directed by council. And finally, this proposed budget focuses on stabilizing existing services and invests in council priorities. Next slide. So the distribution um, of expenditures among departments this cycle is similar to previous years. 36% of the all funds budget goes to direct service departments. This includes housing, library, parks, recreation and youth development, human services, public works, animal services, transportation, planning and building and economic and workforce development. 28% goes to non-departmental, which includes transfers between funds, debt and lease payments and cost of insurance and liability claims. 17.96% goes to police and 10% goes to fire. And the rest goes to administrative departments like finance, um, information technology and human resources and general government departments like city council, city administrator, city clerk. Next slide. So before we discuss some of the significant changes proposed in this budget, it's important to note the framework with which decisions were made. So one, the administration took, direct, took direction from council and invested in their four priorities as discussed by Councilmember Taylor. There's affordable housing and homelessness solutions, public safety and violence prevention, good jobs and vibrant economy and clean, healthy and sustainable neighborhoods. In addition, we were guided by the following principles, which are advanced racial equity, so ensuring that the impact on our low income and BIPOC communities were centered in every step of this process, preserve services and city jobs, and finally protect the city's long-term financial health so that the city is in a good position to recover when the economy rebounds. Next slide. So the next couple of slides are gonna highlight some of the changes by council priority. Um, all the detailed service impacts are provided in the book and Walter will show you that page. Um, and to the extent that most of these, um, these service changes are actually citywide. Um, there, I, I will identify which ones impact um, District 6 um, directly. So under affordable housing and homelessness solutions, the um, budget creates a new homelessness unit in the city administrator's office and allocates both personnel and non-personnel funding to this unit allocates 41 million to prevent homelessness and provide interim and permanent housing to the unhoused. It adds new positions and overtime funding and equipment for encampment cleaning. It allocates 32 million to affordable housing with state and federal funds and creates a new community development and engagement unit in the housing department. Next slide. Under public safety and violence prevention, this budget ramps up the Mobile Assistance Community Responders of Oakland, or MACRO, in the Oakland Fire Department. 
It makes other operational changes recommended by the reimagining public safety process, including moving special activity permits to economic and workforce development. It moves certain vehicle enforcement activities to the Department of Transportation and begins the analysis to shift officer misconduct investigations to police commission. It also increases staffing in the police commission and creates a new trust unit in um, the police department. Next slide. This proposed budget also builds a realistic police budget by aligning the number of budgeted positions to the number of actual officers available as trainees graduate from the police academies. And it corrects the past practice of under budgeting police overtime. It funds six police recruit academies over two years. It restores full staffing to units like tra traffic enforcement and community resource officers in the second half of year two. And it expands Department of Violence Prevention Coordination and Case Management. Next slide. Under good jobs and vibrant economy, the budget increases staffing to improve the efficiency and transparency of the city's permitting services. It fills three positions added in the Department of, of Workplace and Employment Standards, and it contributes to the newly formed Chinatown Business Improvement District and dedicates a specialist to District 6 to lead the economic development activities in East Oakland, including business development, planning, zoning updates, catalytic site development, and community development programs. Next slide. Under clean, healthy, sustainable neighborhoods, the budget increases capacity in the Head Start program um, and increases programming at senior centers. It adds 1.6 million to address blights and illegal dumping and institutionalizes free dump days. And finally, it increases the Department of Transportation staffing to deliver more infrastructure improvements to underserved areas and enhance traffic and pedestrian safety. Next slide. So despite this being the most challenging budget cycle we've been through in terms of the size of the deficit, um, we were really, we were actually able to accomplish some pretty significant enhancements in this process. So one, we have the OpenGov platform, which Walter will be um, guiding us through shortly, um, but it's interactive, it's drillable, data can be downloaded, and it's really all in an effort to promote transparency and ease of use for residents and stakeholders. Um, equity. So we in integrated equity from the very beginning of this process. We worked really closely with the Department of Race and Equity to create an equity analysis tool, which would be used to assess the impact of any proposals on low income and BIPOC communities. And the results of these assessments are included in the book as equity considerations in the service impact section. We also did zero-based budgeting for our non-personnel budgets. So we asked departments to build their non-personnel budgets from scratch and really assess what is needed for their operations. Whereas in the past, we would roll over their previous budget. And for service inventory, departments were asked to provide an inventory of all the services they provide, both internally and externally. And the idea is that eventually we can use this as a starting point to start tracking performance metrics and outcomes. And then finally, the police rebudget. The budget team worked really closely with the police department in reviewing its current operating budget, analyzing its service demands, and rebuilding its entire budget from scratch. So this resulted in a more accurate and really realistic budget for the police and a tool which is available in the budget book that you can use to review the cost of each police service. I'm gonna turn it over now to Walter who's going to provide a short tutorial on OpenGov. Hello, uh, good morning everyone. I'm going to stop sharing the PowerPoint presentation so that way I can reshare the online budget book. So give me one second. All right, can everyone see my screen okay? Yes, we can see it. Perfect, all right. This is the new online budget book. It's our fiscal year 2021-23 proposed policy budget. 
And this first page that we land on is called our landing page. And you can see it by the tab up here, landing page. And as you scroll down, we have some navigation tips and FAQs here that you can select. Also, we have some of what we believe are the, probably the nine most uh, um, interesting tiles that the public may be wanting to visit. So city departments, financial summaries, city organization charts and whatnot. And also we have a table of contents below here where you can select and navigate to any department, uh, mayor's message, budget priorities. So I'll start from the very beginning through the navigation. You can simply select anything that's underlined. It's a link. So we can select this. It's going to bring you to a page. Whenever you select a page, it opens up another tab. So if you ever need to go back, you can select the landing page or at the bottom of every page, you can simply select homepage. It'll bring you back to a landing page also. So I'm gonna go ahead and select the landing page to go back. Uh, you can, again, being that this is a table of contents or uh, city departments, there's a number of ways to get to different pages. So for example, if I wanted to get to public works, I can select city departments. This will bring up all the departments page. And we can select, let's see here, public works. And then that, and here's the public works page. Again, I'm going to select the link at the very bottom just to go back and back at the landing page. I'll use the table of contents to do the same thing. So here's a list of all the departments on the table of contents. We can scroll down, see Public Works, and select Expenditures page, and it brings us to the uh, Public Works page. All of our pages are formatted in the same format or, or style. So you're going to see the mission statement, the service impacts and equity considerations. You'll see the significant budgetary changes. You'll also see financial information. As we scroll down, uh, we have expenditures by category, expenditures by bureau division, and we have position information. What's really cool about OpenGov is anytime you have a chart or, or a pie chart, you can select the chart itself. So for example, here we have funds. If we wanted to look at just general funds, we can select right here, general funds on the side. It's going to filter it by general funds. Or if you were looking at it in a pie fort, uh, I mean, pie chart, you can do the same thing. You would just look for general purpose funds. As I highlight general purpose funds here, it also is underlined here, just letting you know that I'm going to fil filter this by general purpose funds only. Um, we have a slider at the bottom of uh, the pie chart. It lets you know if you're looking at actuals from F F fiscal year 2019, 2020. You can look at mid cycle. You can look at proposed. Whenever you filter down to this level, you may want to be looking at this in a, in a bar chart. That way you can kind of see all the different changes. Uh, what's also nice about this feature is if you wanted to compare departments, you can go back open up an, uh, another department and you'll still have your tab up here for say public works. But let's just say I want to also look at, let's just say department of transportation. I can have the two tabs open up and I can compare between public works and I can jump back and forth between transportation and public works. Also, the information on these charts, you can export this information if you want to you know, manipulate, manipulate the data or you want an image of this information. You can simply go to where it says share. You can email it to yourself. You can get the image here, or you can download the actual spreadsheet, the data behind all these different charts. We can go back to the landing page. Uh, we can take a look at the mayor's message. As you can see, all the information is here. We 
we can look at service impact citywide. Please note the service impacts are also located on the department pages. Uh, but if you wanted to capture all of them, you have a summary here for all the different departments under service impacts. I'm going to go back to the landing page. And, and, and again, what's, the, what's really neat about this feature here is you can really go into these, um, each department. You can really drill down into their information. And again, if, if I'm looking at the, uh, this, this department, you can just select general funds and you can just keep selecting it. It continues to drill down the information. As you, you know, scroll over each bar chart, you can see the information that, that's popping up here, you know, proposed budget. So you can see the different changes. That's, you know, if you want to just drill down to successor re redevelopment, just select it. It'll bring up just that piece of information by itself. You can change the format in which how you want to see the information, how it's presented, whether it's a stacked line, pie, or bar graph. Walter, can you um, show the transparency portal as well? Sure. And Below any of the pages, department pages, we have the transparency portal. So we have a link here. So we have all of the various reports here in, in our saved views. And you can download any of this information. It's all available in the transparency portal. Now let's scroll down, we can go to the revenue. And in the transparency portal, it acts the same as the department pages. You can drill down into any of the information. Say you want to look into property tax. You can select property tax. And below any bar chart, you have the information below. And again, the, all this information can be exported. So simply just click share, you can email it. And I believe that's all that I have here. For I think the last thing you'll wanna show Walter is the um, third page for the police department. Oh, the police department. So every department has two pages, but being the police department, we've added an extra page for police. Well, let me find the police department. There we go. So the police department, we have the expenditures information page, but we also have the budget transparency information page. Here they talk about staffing. Um, we also talk about the timing of the police academies and the proposed biennial budget. We have information about police overtime. And this is an additional page for, for the uh, city residents regarding the police department. Just go back to the homepage and just bring up the police. Here's the on, on every page, there's a significant budgetary changes. So you can see all the different changes um, that's being proposed for the department.
And also just, just to note here, whenever you're looking at the information, you can collapse the information so that way you can just look at it as, I just wanna see general funds, special revenues. You can expand any area. And again, this is all drillable. You can drill down here at this level on, on the uh, spreadsheet here or up here. Up here, you can simply just continue to click until you get to the single level of what you're looking for. And then on every page, we also have the FTE count from year to year. And you can right here, it's sorted by bureau, but you can see the mid cycle the propose for the two years. Okay, thank you, Walter. So I think that concludes our presentation, Councilmember Taylor. Thanks so much for that, uh, Lisa, Walter, and Aaron, and the rest of the finance team who's put in uh, incredible amount of work over the past several months in order to aggregate all the information from the different departments and, uh, as you saw, create a tool that allows greater transparency, uh, allows each of us to get in and really dig in, uh, manipulate the data to uh, greater transparency and accessibility of the budget. Um, Right now, I think we have time for a few questions. So if anyone has any questions in the uh, participants panel, please raise your hand and we will work to unmute you. Before we do, I'll take uh, a couple questions out of the chat. The first one that comes up, there are two comments related to real estate market being red hot. And the parallel question is why are property taxes expected to grow? I'm not sure who can best uh, answer that from the finance team. Hoping Margaret can step in. Margaret, are you able to uh, jump in to address property taxes? I know she was driving, so she might not be available right now. Hi, Councilor Taylor. Brad, I can probably take it while Margaret is uh, indisposed. Oh, so she needs to be unmuted. Sorry. Oh, here, let's oh, find let's let's find Margaret and unmute her. All right. All righty. Try this again. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Um, so regarding the property, um, can you repeat the question, please? Yes, uh, it's asking about property taxes, why they're expected to grow, given all the other, uh, I guess, other funds were declining. And then there was another comment that talked about how the Oakland real estate market is red hot right now. Yes. Um, so I'll take the um, property tax question first. Property taxes grow under Proposition 13. So just in a regular non-hot market year, they can grow up to 2% um, per year. The other reason that the property taxes are expected to grow in the coming years is because of redevelopment dissolution, obligations that the, re the former redevelopment agency was responsible for are starting to um, come off the recognized payment schedule. And those funds now that would have been diverted to that go back into the, the, um, the trust fund and get distributed to the various taxing entities, one of which is the city of Oakland. So a combination of those two things, one, the allowable increase under Prop 13, just for properties that we've held for a while, and then this loss or this, um, this uh, retirement of obligations <clears throat> under um, on the, obligation schedule from the redevelopment agency. So those two things are driving it. Plus, the other thing that happens is when properties transfer hands, they become reassessed. So if I've owned a property in Oakland for, let's say, 15 years, and then I, it, it gets assessed at roughly what I paid for it, plus 2% a year over the 15 years. 
now that I'm selling the property, it can be reassessed at full market value or sale value. So if I bought a property for $500,000 and I'm now selling it for a million dollars, that property's new owner will be assessed property taxes based on that purchase price. So um, the, that is the reason property taxes are expected to grow. Um, yes, we do have a red hot real estate market. Um, it's, it's very impressive right now. We've had some, seen some large commercial transfers when we published the quarterly report on June 1st, I, rec I always put a table in there that shows the bands of um, sale values and where they are increasing. The, the largest portion of um, increase in sale price has been in our 300,000 to $2 million property range. Um, so it's good news for Oakland in some respects because, and I said this a lot over the, my past years at the city, approximately 50 to 55 percent in any given year of our general purpose fund unrestricted revenues are tied to the real estate market, whether it's through the property tax, whether it's through, through real estate transfer tax, um, whether it is through uh, transient occupancy tax. And there's one I'm missing, and I always miss one. Um, so that, that should answer the property question. Thanks for that, Margaret. I think embedded in that question is, uh, are we taking into account the red hot market, in a, uh, market uh, with respect to the projected revenues and increases, like the real estate transfer taxes, et cetera? Can you address that? Correct. Oh, okay. I can address that. So we definitely have taken it into account with the, um, the property tax. So this year, we actually hired an economist. Um, based in, in Oakland, they're called Blue Sky, and they helped us really dig into the data and they started our forecast. So they have accounted for the property taxes. Um, again, um, you know, the, the real estate transfer tax is a highly volatile tax. Um, we do our best to forecast it. Sometimes we, we you know, you, you can't predict these some of these large commercial property transfers. So we may see some additional growth when we release the um, the Q3 report on June 1st and the subsequent what we call an errata, but possible amendments to the proposed budget. Thank you. So with additional information, we will be able to, uh, if justified, increase the projected revenues if we see the market continuing or getting even more hot. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, one of the other questions in the, uh, in the chat before we go to the hands is related to OPD and how a zero-based budgeting process reflects a, and, and I'll just read it, exactly how, if at all, did the zero-based budgeting process reflect a reduction in the reach and cost of OPD as demanded by the public during the reimagined safety process? Uh, that's directly, and then uh, also related to OPD is, is it true that one OPD officer was paid $640,000 um, and I assume that's in a given year. Uh, and, and the total overtime was $40 million. So is someone from finance able to uh, address those two aspects of uh, OPD and OPD financing? Brad? Sure, let me jump in there. Thanks, Councilman Lord Taylor. Uh, regarding the first question, which is what does the zero-based budget process look like? We attempted to rebuild the cost of their services that they were providing uh, sort of at their base level. As many people are aware, OPD has for many, many years overspent their budget. And so our objective on that exercise was to capture the cost of services provided as a baseline. From that, from that sort of new baseline, uh, the mayor and city administrator made decisions as to which services we would continue to provide and which ones we wouldn't. And those, and then those particular policy decisions were incorporated into the proposed budget. Uh, I would note that some of the task force recommendations were available at the time we were putting the proposed budget. The council approved their um, prioritization of the task force recommendations actually after the 1st of May. So we were well into the space of actually having sort of finalized budgetary decisions by then. Um, there are some things uh, in the proposed budget that are consistent with the task force recommendations. For instance, moving vehicle enforcement uh, units to DOT in year two of the budget. Um, but we do uh, expect the council to uh, look at their prioritization 
uh, and review it against what we propose. Uh, the key about this, the key thing about this process, though, was to come up with a budget that, if adopted, would clearly align the cost of services with the services we're providing, so that we could keep OPD within whatever a budget is approved. That was sort of the objective and overriding goal of that exercise. Thank, thank you for that, Brad. Um, and, I, and I can't, I can't answer a question regarding any specific officer. I'm not, a, I'm not, a, not aware of that necessarily, but I don't have data to say one way or another. Okay. Thank you for that. So just to summarize what uh, Brad was saying uh, really simply, I think the zero based budgeting exercise is what the city administrator did because uh, he and others recognized that we weren't being honest with how we were budgeting for OPD before. So a lot of times we budgeted much less than we knew we would need to spend. And as a result, uh, it, it wasn't, uh, we weren't setting ourselves up for success in terms of holding to a specific budget amount. And so the, the zero based budgeting was an attempt to be accurate uh, with respect to the uh, what it would cost to provide certain services. Um, I do want to acknowledge the reimagining safety process and then I'll go to Keisha who's first in the queue and also um, the district six representative on the uh, reimagining public safety task force that there are around 48 recommendations that came out of the reimagining public safety process. Many of those uh, were focused on really accountability, ensuring that we had the right accountability uh, and, and structures within the police department. Uh, others, many others were focused on how we can offload service calls and other services that police are doing where they're not the best equipped to do so and shift those to non-police responses so that we can have our police officers focus on those where they are most valued and most needed. So crime, uh, dangerous crime, violent crime, uh, public safety elements there. And so there are a few things that were incorporated into the, um, the mayor's budget in terms of offsetting special events from police, offsetting some aspects of traffic enforcement uh, and parking enforcement to police but there are others that will be up for the council to review and incorporate uh, as, as we see it makes sense. And so we will be going through that process over the next six months and I encourage everyone here to provide your thoughts and perspectives on the reimagining safety task force recommendations. And I'm asking uh, those on my team to put the link there to the reimagining public safety task force recommendations into the chat so that folks can at their time dig into them. Next, first in the queue of the uh, participant hands, I see Keisha Henderson. If someone can unmute her, ask her to unmute. Okay, I'm unmuted. Um, so I have a pay. Hey, so I have a few questions. Um, well, I'll start off um, about the reimagining public safety task force board. So I've recently seen um, that uh, Councilwoman Fife put out what the priorities were. Um, and I'm assuming is that going to just be the priorities that the council is going to focus on? Because for me, those some of those priorities are some of the ones I did vote for and agree, and some some of them was the ones that I did not. And one of the things that I'm worried about is that I, I don't see anything in there that focuses on the reorganization of the OPD um, structure. Um, and also just, I don't really see accountability um, on that list. And I'm, I'm, I'm highly worried about that, um, especially being a D6, um, uh, not just a D6 representative for the task force board, but just living here. I mean, everything was seemed like it was one-sided. So I'm a bit worried about that list. Um, also, when it comes down to the um, improvements, do, do anyone know if there's going to be any improvements coming to like the Arroyo Vejo Rec Center or the Rainbow uh, Rec Center's Digital Arts and Culinary Academy? Um, and also, I wanted to add about the Rainbow Rec Center, which is I live around the corner from, is I went to visit that site a few times um, within the last few months. Um, and one of the things that I noticed is that it's a beautiful building, but it's constantly very trashy. The creeks is, is completely trashy. The camera systems that is supposed to help protect uh, when, when residents or children is playing in that park does not work. 
and there's a lot of high crime that's happening around that area. And so I think that that, like, what is going on with that type of issue? Also, when it comes down to the, um, I know that there was a presentation, uh, I can't think of the, the lady that was just, um, that just presented not too long ago. How much money is going towards our public works uh, system? Because as a homeowner in D6 and in the flatlands, the issues that I'm having is that our public works system doesn't work too well for, for homeowners and residents in the flatlands. And I think you said it was 1.6 million, I think. Is that, I don't know if I'm correct about that, but I feel like that's highly low. Um, and the amount of, of issues that is happening in our area, and I know I'm one of the residents who constantly report, it takes them months and months and months to address the issue. Sometimes they don't address it. I mean, it, it's, it's just like that, that those are the issues that like, it's just a lot of issues going on. Uh, even for example, our residents on my block right now, our green bins are still out. Um, it has not got collected and our trash is supposed to be collected on Wednesday. So we have all of these issues. So then when I start hearing about property taxes going up, I still feel like I'm getting robbed of my property taxes. We don't get the same level of, of um, help that some of the other areas are getting in Oakland. And so I, I, I'm very concerned about this budget. And I'm also concerned about the priority list from coming from the task force board when it comes down to accountability uh, with OPD. Thank you for that, Keisha. Um, so there's a number of things wrapped into what you're sharing. And I saw some nodding of others who are visibly on the screen that there's some agreement. So I, I took some notes. I wanna make sure that we're hitting the different ones. With respect to the reimagining public safety task force, yeah, you're right, there was a proposal that we prioritize some of the recommendations and lift them up. And that was initiated by council member Fife. There are a number of uh, recommendations that I and then other council members lifted up as well into that process so that there was a, a I think a broader list. And what I included addresses some of what you're describing relative to the accountability, uh, also relative to prioritizing violent crime and uh, violence prevention. And so uh, one of the recommendations that was prioritized and actually lifted up by a majority of the task force members was related to any possible savings that we get from a reimagining safety process, first and foremost goes towards violence prevention, uh, addressing violence prevention and violent crime. And so that was one of those that was incorporated. The, the fact of prioritizing what that really means at this point, is because we're not doing the budget deliberations yet, is that we prioritize those for staff to evaluate and put some costing around. There wasn't enough structure around all of the recommendations, so we wanted to know exactly what they would cost in order to move forward. Uh, you mentioned some of our parks and recreation facilities, so DACA, um, the Digital Arts and Culinary uh, Academy, Rainbow Rec Center, uh, et cetera. And so I, I'm gonna ask our finance team to kind of address that. We also are going to have the presentation on the capital improvement program, but I can report that the DACA project is already funded in terms of a second phase of upgrading the Digital Arts Culinary uh, Arts Academy. And so that is underway currently being planned and preparation. And I believe that they're going to start uh, actually um, the construction later this year. You talk about cleaning and blight and beautification. Uh, if our finance team can address that aspect in terms of what we're contributing, investing relative to that in the budget, if you guys can tee that up. But one thing I did want to address with respect to it is that um, I've been pushing very hard around performance management and true transparency as to how we are deploying our public works resources and other resources, what's going into North Oakland, what's going into West Oakland, uh, Rockridge, and then East Oakland, and, and specifically District 6. And so the uh, accountability and measurement, not just what's the total dollars that we're allocating, but how we're actually making sure that we get the appropriate amount of uh, services in our part of the city and that that's being consistent. Uh, and then obviously, 
waste management, other things that are outside of the city scope, you can certainly elevate it to my office. We can help to, to track it down if they're not picking up garbage service, et cetera, but want to make sure that uh, we are pulling in the appropriate uh, sort of agency that is doing that work because the city of Oakland doesn't pick up the green bins, et cetera. So thank you for that, Keisha. Um, finance team, do you have any responses related to how much is going towards public works um, uh, in the budget and some of the other aspects around cleaning, beautification, taking care of our, our town? Sure, I can take a stab at that. Cool. Thank you. Um, okay, so in total, the budget um, in year one for OPW actually is uh, 167 million. That's actually an increase from the mid cycle, the current fiscal year at 164 million. So the 1.6 million that was referenced earlier is actually an additional um, amount that's being added to the illegal dumping division um, to remove trash um, in right of way. Um, and it also includes um, extra money for the free dump day or the bulky block party. We're also adding 2.25 million um, in one-time monies to, um, for encampment cleaning from Measure Q. Um, and that's going to be used to, uh, for overtime to enhance park bathrooms and sanitation services. Um, and then we're also maintaining funding for an additional encampment crew um, which will bring the total encampment crews to five for the coming two years. Thank you for that, Lisa. Uh, I saw Sean coming online. Uh, Sean, I'm not sure if you had anything to add. And actually, I'm going to call an audible and maybe shift to the capital improvements program. So if you can address that question, and then we'll lead into the uh, the presentation on the capital improvements program and then shift back to questions from the audience. So Sean. Thank you, council member. And uh, thank you to, to everyone who's here today. Uh, it's, it's great to be connecting with, uh, with our community on, on a Saturday. I appreciate your time and, and your interest in, in these topics. Uh, my name is Sean Maher. I'm a public information officer. Uh, I work for you in your departments of public works and transportation. Uh, I'm mostly here today to talk about the capital improvement program with a couple colleagues of mine, uh, but I did want to um, elevate real quick while we're on the topic of, of blight and, and getting rid of waste and illegal dumping that uh, the city announced uh, on Thursday that we're going to be bringing back the bulky block party events. Uh, this is going to be a monthly event where Oakland residents can dispose of basically anything, uh, anything that won't fit in your bin, uh, you can dispose of for free. Uh, as long as you can provide uh, like a household bill or something else that demonstrates that you're, that, uh, you're an Oakland resident. Uh, the first event is going to be on May 22nd, uh, a week from today, uh, from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. at 7101 Edgewater Drive. Uh, and subsequently to that, it'll be every month on the last Saturday of the month. So we're very excited to bring those back. Uh, you know, when we look at what is, is, is being dumped on Oakland streets, most of what we find is that it's household household waste. And when we're able to trace it back to a particular household, it's usually from within Oakland. So we know that the affordability crisis is, crisis is affecting this issue. We know that our, our community is under more financial duress than ever. And we wanna make sure that the uh, the services that are available to get rid of stuff without, without it ending up on our streets are as affordable and accessible as possible. And this is the, just the latest in a number of announcements we're hoping to make over the course of the summer, but wanted to make sure that folks knew that the, the bulky block party is back. With that, I'll shift into um, talking about the, the capital improvement program. Uh, Denise, are you able to, to share screen and bring up the slides? that shared. Perfect. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll introduce this as, as briefly as I can. I know there's a lot of important questions on the table here today. Um, so parallel to uh, the city's operating budget is the city's capital budget. A lot of what we've been talking about so far today is about what services we're funding, what staff the city is, 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 uh, is hiring and assigning to which duties. 
the capital improvement program is, is part of the capital budget, which basically diverts uh, or, or, or directs um, the city's fund for capital projects. Uh, capital projects basically um, build or improve or repair the city's capital assets, which is basically things like our streets, our public buildings, uh, rec centers, parks, libraries, um, city facilities of all, of all kinds are all capital assets and the capital budget is what goes to to supporting either having those those assets built or renovated or improved. They're, they're, they're the big ticket items. Um, if you're looking to get a pothole patched on your street, that's a maintenance item and you just call 311 and, 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 and that's handled, handled by a maintenance budget. But if that street needs to be completely rebuilt, that's a capital project, um, just for to give an example. Uh, next slide. So this is what we're going to run through in, in our in our presentation to you today. Again, my name is Sean. I'm joined by uh, my colleagues Denise Louie in Public Works and Yvonne Chan in the Department of Transportation. Um, and this is just a, a, a list of the items that we're going to cover uh, in the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, we're going to start with a little bit of background. Uh, the Capital Improvement Program has gone through some really exciting change in the last two or three years. Uh, and we're excited to, to let you know about kind of what that change has looked like so far and, and how you can continue to uh, make sure it's working for you. Uh, then we will uh, take a look at what uh, the budget looks like this year, uh, including some of the recommendations by funding source, uh, and we'll we'll do some highlights on District 6, uh, uh, as a District 6 CIP summary. So, the, 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 the picture of city investment and in capital projects changed really dramatically in 2016 when voters passed Measure KK. Uh, Measure KK is an infrastructure bond that provides $600 million in capital funding over the next 10 years. Uh, prior to this, the, the city's capital budgets were all at really um, below uh, unsustainable levels. Uh, our, our, our infrastructure was uh, was not getting the funding necessary even to keep it at its current condition. So with this influx of, of, of capital funding, we wanted to take a, a fresh look at the process for spending it. And we wanted to get the community's input at the ground floor of that. Uh, effectively, what we did is we, we built a new scorecard that every potential capital project would have to compete on and, and, and meet, uh, meet uh, meet certain factors that would that would determine whether how competitive how desirable a project was and we wanted to get the community's input on what those what the weighting of those factors was uh, thinking about like when you're when you're taking a test in high school and there's multiple choice questions that are relatively easy and, and worth just a point or two and then there's the essay question that's you know a bigger lift and, and harder to do and it's a you know it's a 20 or 30 point question we wanted the community's input on on what are the little things that don't really matter quite so much to you and what are the what are the big ones what are the things that should really matter the most and so we did a, a community engagement process to build that out uh and ended up uh, producing a scorecard that reflected pretty well exactly what the community told us that the the factors that mattered most were were equity uh investing in neighborhoods that were historically underinvested in and health and safety projects that would contribute to making a, a, a community affected by the, by the project safer and healthier. And we are excited that the council adopted that, that, uh, that, that scorecard, that process uh, in our previous budget cycle. But one thing that, that we got asked for when we were developing that was the community wanted access to that process itself. We, we heard from a lot of folks, you know, the, the scorecard is fine, I'm glad to give my input on it, but what I really want is access to it. I want you to look at my project idea and I want you to score it. I don't wanna to have to go through some, you know, someone who's connected. I don't wanna to have to know somebody at city hall. I just wanna be able to tell you what I want built in my neighborhood or what I want fixed in my neighborhood and for you to run that idea through the scorecard. So in the middle of the, pro of the, of the process, two, two, two and a half years ago, we stood that up, we tried to uh, meet that ask and we created a, a portal for community members to request projects. 
And this budget cycle that we're in is the is the second ever time that we've we've done that. So we we carried it over to this year, and uh, and collected community input on what projects folks wanted us to consider. That led to um, this 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 uh, framework of nine factors. So once we got all the all the input, once we got all the requests that community members wanted to wanted to have considered, we ran them through the scorecard itself, and that's what I'm gonna talk about in the next slide. So across the, there are nine factors and, and across the top, you'll see that, that equity is really the starting point. It is the, it is the first factor, it's the biggest one uh, together with health and safety. They're both 16 points, uh, a, a potential 16 points out of a total of 100 points that a score that a project can score. Additional factors are health and safety. Uh, the existing conditions. So, if a a building or a street or an, an, or a park is especially in especially poor condition, uh, that helps um, increase the the score for a proposal to fix it. Uh, projects that contribute to the local economy, projects that have a positive environmental impact, uh, projects that are what we call required work. So, this is things like helping meet our requirements under the Americans with Disabilities Act, for example. There are a whole number of regulations that, uh, that drive projects. Uh, how much does a, does a project improve on an existing asset? Uh, does a project reflect collaboration between uh, the city and community or city, or city and other, uh, other local partners like uh, utilities, PG&E or East Bay Mud, who are often uh, you know, digging up our streets to, to do improvements to their infrastructure? Can we collaborate with them to save some money on repairing a street? And project readiness is a project good to go. It can happen in the next couple of years when we know that some projects have a very long timeline. So those are the, those are the nine factors. And within, so while we have equity as its own standalone factor, we've also built it into several of the other factors. So uh, a, a project that improves health and safety has a disproportionately important impact uh, in some neighborhoods than in others. Um, the example I, I tend to think of is, is in West Oakland where our asthma rates are, are five times what they are uh, for, for citywide uh, community members. A project that improves the, the quality of the air and, and provides better health and safety to our neighbors there, it has a bigger impact than a project in uh, a neighborhood that doesn't have that, that challenge. And with that, I think I will, that's, that's the scorecard. Uh, I think this has me handing it over to my colleague, Yvonne. Thanks, Sean, and hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Yvonne Chan, and I'm a transportation planner on the capital finance team for the Department of Transportation. So this first slide I have shows two charts that compare the outcomes between the previous and current uh, capital improvement program cycles for the public project request process that Sean had described. So the first chart on the left shows the public request we received by the type of capital asset. Um, during both CIP cycles, we've seen the most interest in projects related to transportation, followed by parks and open spaces, then buildings and structures. The second chart we have on the right shows the number of project requests we received by Oakland neighborhood. Um, the pink bars show the results of our engagement for the previous cycle, um, and the yellow or green bars show this cycle's results. Overall, we've seen participation increase um, from about 360 project requests last cycle to increasing to nearly 400. Um, one of the main highlights of these results of our engagement is that we found that our dedicated effort to focus our engagement in East and Deep East Oakland helped us meet our goal to improve participation in neighborhoods that were underrepresented in the previous budget cycle. Overall, while there's still more work to do to improve our engagement around the capital program, improvement program, we did find that our focused engagement in East and Deep East Oakland helped even out and overall increase community engagement in the capital budget process. Um, next slide, please. So this table shows a summary of the proposed CIP budget by funding source. The total proposed CIP budget um, is that number in the bottom left corner. Um, so that is a proposed $276 million over the next two years 
um, to be spent on a total of 69 capital projects. The fund sources are listed in the first column. This ranges from the general fund to EPA, uh, State of California, Measure B and BB sales tax, Measure Q, Super Service Equipment, Rockridge uh, Library Assessment District, Measure DD, um, and last but not least, the Measure KK infrastructure bond, which represents over 200 million or over 75% of the proposed capital budget. Um, so I think that's my last slide. I'll now hand it over to Denise Louie from the Public Works Department, who uh, will do a deeper dive into the Measure KK balance summary. So hi, everyone. Good morning. Again, my name is Denise Louie. I'm a project manager in Public Works, and I am also the Public Works CIP lead. Uh, this slide uh, is the IBON Measure KK summary table uh, showing a history of appropriations and the balance of the IBON for facilities and structures and transportation categories. Within the facilities and structures categories, the IBON amount was further broken down into what I call five buckets, library, police, fire, environment, and a shared bucket between parks and recreation and human services. A total of 48 million is proposed to be spent from the facilities and structures category and 154 million from the transportation category. Note that both library and the Parks and Rec and Human Services shared buckets will be fully programmed and environmental funding will almost be depleted as well. Uh, over 38 million of the IBON Measure KK will be available for future uh, CIP projects in fire and police and over 57 million for future transportation CIP projects. So this slide shows CIP uh, programs and projects that are citywide or funding shared between multi-districts. Uh, over 192 million are invested in such programs such as sewer, storm drain, Americans with Disability or ADA, bike pedestrian, street surfacing, safe routes, to just name a few. Um, my uh, colleague Sean placed a link um, at the beginning of the meeting uh, for more information um, and more details, you can uh, check out that link. So what this shows is approximately 18 million um, shared for public works programs and Projects that are identified for District 6 to receive a portion of that shared funding include um, Martin Luther King Library Energy Assessment, which is adjacent to District 7, uh, Fire Station 17 HVAC, which is sort of right on the border with District 4, and Cortland Creek Restoration, which is similar right on the, uh, or shared between District 4 as well. For transportation, District 6 projects um, that are identified to receive funding um, from the Complete Street Program are the 73rd Avenue Active Connections, Bancroft Greenway, East Bay Greenway Segment 2, East Oakland Neighborhood Bike Routes, the HSIP Foothill MacArthur, International Boulevard Pedestrian Lighting, and from Neighborhood Traffic Safety uh, safety and safe routes program is the East Oakland Pride Elementary School. And this slide lists out projects that were specific funding uh, identified for District 6. Over 41 million will be invested through sanitary sewer infrastructure, police, and feasibility study for a joint use complex uh, for police with Fire Station 29 and of course, funding for the new Fire Station 29 project. So um, again, we'd like to thank you for sharing your Saturday morning with us to learn a little bit more about Capital Improvement Program. For more information, um, please go to our uh, CIP website um, located at www.oaklandca.gov slash topics slash capital improvement program or email us at cip at oaklandca.gov. 
And on that note, we are done, Council Member. Thank you for that, Denise, uh, and then also the rest of the team for presenting. Uh, one of the questions that was raised in the chat was, we're spending a lot, it basically says capital improvement projects are being talked in so much depth. I didn't see this in the council priorities. Are we also going to have a rundown of how the budget will address your actual priorities like affordable housing and uh, addressing homelessness? So <clears throat> I responded to that in the chat and added the link. There's a specific section that uh, Walter reviewed in the budget document that is specifically related to the service impacts and it's aligned to the four council priorities. And so within affordable housing and homelessness solutions, there's uh, a full section detailing what the enhancements to the budget are. Also public safety and violence prevention. Uh, in addition to that, good jobs and vibrant economy, and then also clean, healthy and sustainable neighborhoods. So that um, is, is there for folks to review in more detail. Uh, and I know we touched on a few of those specifically. Um, maybe we can go back to the queue of those who have hands raised. I see next in the queue is, it looks like Tony Dakipa. Tony, you're unmuted. Yeah, thank you. Um, I am a homeowner in the Eastmont Flatlands and I am very, very, very happy with the brand new streets that we got last year. Uh, speaking of capital improvements, thank you very much for the new streets. My question is um, how much money in this budget is uh, dedicated to Oakland Promise? And that's my question. Okay, not sure if we have anyone from finance who can address that. Is there, what is in the budget that is dedicated to Oakland Promise? the proposed budget. Give me a minute to find that information. Okay, so while she, uh, while Lisa's looking for that, maybe we'll go to the next person. I see David Fokey. Um, I'll go ahead and ask you to unmute so you can make a comment or question. Hi. Yeah, I'm uh, interested in a little bit more detail about the police department budget. Um, in the presentation, language was used like rebudgeting and appropriate budgeting and things like that. If one were to be cynical, I would easily be able to interpret that as papering over actual increases in the police department budget. We're members of Oakland Rising and a recent analysis of the budget by Oakland Rising alleges that the uh, budget proposes to increase the police budget to formalize and legitimize the OPD's overtime abuses and that there is a new uh, $19 million investment in police buildings and a $500,000 commitment to plan for a $500 million new OPD headquarters. Can you tell us whether the proposed budget actually proposes to increase the police budget and whether it's planning to invest in new police buildings? Thank you uh, for that question, David. So uh, I guess maybe I'll go to Brad because I think you'll probably, if Brad's still there, the best person to answer it. Um, I'm gonna go ahead. It looks like, I'm gonna ask you, Brad, are you there? I am here and I apologize. You might get a little bit of noise, so let me try to answer it quickly. Uh, the rebudgeting effort was designed to appropriately allocate the funding for the services that OPD has provided in the in which provides a better starting point for the mayor to make decisions on how they would like to allocate resources. Uh, OPD does use substantial overtime to perform services. That is a key function, a key way that they have provided services in the past. Uh, apologies for that. I know, Brad, you just went on mute and it was a little bit hard to hear. Um, I think 
to be more specific relative to the question, I believe that David's asking, has the OPD budget um, increased or decreased relative to uh, the, the prior year's budget? I think that was one of the, uh, a specific question. And I don't know, Brad, if you're able to speak to that, uh, come off mute and speak to that, or if there's someone else that can address it from finance. Hi, this is Aaron, Aaron Roseman. Um, while Brad's having technical difficulties, I'll address it. There is a decrease from uh, for the police department budget. Um, if you look in the OpenGov tutorial or on the pages, if you were on the police um, uh, landing page and you could do the slider of the pie chart from mid cycle to the next year, you'll see that the percentage of the police department decreases from year over year. The Thank you for that, Aaron. Um, I do know that one of the other parts of David's question was related to the uh, the police administration building. And there are some uh, capital dollars, I believe, that are allocated, not on an operating side of operating the police department, but capital dollars relative to investing in the building. And perhaps someone can speak to the police administration building or the headquarters and the proposed budget there. I know that that's a project that um, has a lot of sort of reasons or factors for why it is moving forward or attempting to move forward. I don't know if that's a CIP question or if anyone else is able to speak to it. Um, hi, council member, it's Denise Louie here. So hi, Thanks. Um, yeah, the, the few years ago with uh, the initial Measure KK, um, uh, there was a feasibility study for a brand new PAB facility. Um, and it identified you know, a need of, um, I believe over $400 million. Um, and since then, police had not identified any projects um, from their bucket of Measure KK, the IBON. And so in this, uh, budget cycle, they, you know, there are uh, items um, mainly on the roof that need to be addressed and things like their emergency generator system um, need to be addressed. Um, and so they have um, proposed to start using their major KK funding uh, bucket to address those, you know, needs. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's basically what the funding, you know, that has been identified. It is coming out of uh, the police bucket um, that they had not used in, um, you know, the two previous budget cycles. Okay, thank you. Uh, some follow-up questions to that I see in the chat. Um, I don't know if I understand, does the police budget include capital improvement projects that go towards, say, the police administration building? I think that's one question. And then I, another question that was, uh, is out there is, with respect to the, you said measure KK dollars, are those dollars legislatively directed, like they have to go towards um, the police building infrastructure? Or is that, uh, is there discretion associated with that? If that's something you can answer, Denise. Uh, I can attempt and then I might need some support from our uh, budget office uh, colleagues. Um, so basically, I think what I'm hearing is, uh, you know, there there's an operating budget for departments and then there's this piece of it that is the capital improvement. Um, the, the measure KK piece was identified when the bond was passed and it was, you know, uh, specifically broken down into those five buckets that um, I had mentioned in the presentation and police did receive, you know, um, a certain amount of that uh, measure KK overall, just as did, you know, libraries, as did fire, as did transportation. So, um, you know, as far as I understand how the measure KK is that, yes, it is um, restricted to use for capital improvement uh, 
project specific for police. Okay. Thank, thank you for that. I think that addresses the, the questions that were raised there. Um, not sure if anyone else had anything else to add. I saw Lisa in the chat identify that $500,000 per year are allocated, is dedicated uh, in the budget to Oakland Promise. And if I can add a little bit to that, I believe that is for the uh, kindergarten to college uh, savings program where specifically where those dollars go towards the um, I will say a, a an initial deposit into the kindergartners college savings account if uh, if I have that incorrect someone from finance please correct me in in terms of that if, if it's the same as what was allocated in prior years I know that's what was identified. Perhaps we can go to next the next person in the queue, and I see Jose Rosaleo. Jose, you should be able to unmute. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, um, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for spending your Saturday to explain this process to the community. I'm really, I'm also really, um, I'm a resident in District Six, um, also in the East Pond, East Pond Hills area right on the border on, on next to MacArthur. So I'm very happy for the repayment of MacArthur and the different phases that it's going to continue to go through. And the other um, neighborhoods like Hillside getting repaved and just the different streets getting repaved. I think it's great. Well, um, so my question is um, on the CIP, um, there is a big, uh, one, the question, one question is on the on the equity piece. So the previous cycle to this cycle, it seems like there is a huge resources that went into um, downtown and um, and less to East Oakland. So there is a there is an opportunity lost there. Uh, uh, so how is that measure in an equation? Because the whole point is to capture equity. So. Um, how is it? How is it that we had so much a disparity gap between improvements from downtown to, especially I'm in East Oakland, to those communities in East Oakland? Um, can someone answer that? What, why is that gap so large? And how do we play? How, how do we catch up? Because those those are not just dollars; those are millions and millions of dollars that the community lost there. And the other piece of it is moving forward. Um, how do we uh, ensure that the community who really needs the improvement, uh, such as East Oakland, gets to have a say in terms of the process in the CIP? Because a lot, um, some people find it by chance uh, on some of the projects. So how are you going to ensure that people get an opportunity to participate in this process that is actually people who, you know, don't have the knowledge or the capability or access. How, how do we how do we bridge that gap in the equity? Because one question, one is the formula to when the projects are in, but the other equity is that people who actually need the improvements are not part of the discussion from the beginning. So how do you plan to bridge that gap? Sean, I see you there. Maybe you can jump in. Yeah, I'll jump in on that one. I really appreciate this question because uh, this was a major priority for us uh, in, in this cycle as well. You know, when we when we looked at the 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 basically like a, a map of community requests that we got in in our cycle two years ago uh, when we were, were were first rolling this this this, uh, this system out, um, we saw the same thing you see. We we looked at the map of the results that we got. And east of 66th, it was it was almost an empty map. Uh, we our our community engagement uh, in in that part of town, in this part of town, um, had failed. had had just really not produced representative participation. Uh, and that's our responsibility. I don't think that that's because uh, you know the the community wasn't organized or didn't uh, know really you know exactly what uh, what it wanted to see. You know, there's a lot of uh, great community organization out here and a lot of good vision. A lot of community leadership that we had just not captured in the last cycle. So that was actually our top priority uh, in doing community engagement in this cycle. So last summer and fall, uh, right as, as shelter in place was really kind of limiting some of our options, 
we were looking for ways that we could could target our, our community engagement efforts really specifically in the footprint uh, east of 66th and south of 580. Uh, almost all of our community engagement activity was, was in that footprint. And one of the ways that we worked to try to make the process accessible was we created a, a text message survey that folks could use to tell us very simply, very quickly, what I wanna see fixed, where I live and how you can follow up with, follow up with me. And we made that survey available by, by text message in an effort to kind of bridge some of the digital gap because we know that online surveys sometimes can create uh, accessibility challenges. We, uh, we printed up door hangers. We wanted to make sure that people didn't have to be part of a group or part of a club uh, to, to hear about this program and to get to participate. So we printed up door hangers and did a canvassing effort. Uh, we, we dropped more than 6,000 door hangers, uh, just going block by block, door to door, and, uh, and, um, and, and placing those in, in that, same, that same area. Uh, we feel like we saw a lot of progress. The, uh, the work continues, equity is a long-term a long-term effort, uh, but we saw a significant uptick. We saw um, the participation and the representation of East Oakland community requests go from being vastly underrepresentative uh, per capita to, to slightly overrepresentative. Uh, so we we were grateful that the that uh, the process seemed to begin working better. Uh, and we're looking forward to to doing more of that uh, as we go ahead. And if there are ways that folks here would like to see the city engage a little more effectively. We'd love to hear them and we'd love to work with you on them. Thanks for that response, Sean. Um, I guess also thank you for you coming out personally and others uh, to the Acoma market because I know that was just being out physically in the district and in East Oakland, spreading the word about the capital improvement program and how folks can fill out their uh, project ideas was uh, helpful. The one thing I did want to follow up on from Jose's uh, question, which is something that I similarly share a uh, concern about. Since we've been working in a way that has been more biased towards other parts of the city, even if we were to have a sort of uh, equity, you know, more, more uh, and more access and opportunity, say this year, that doesn't necessarily address that we've got, say, five to 10 years of backlog of approved projects that are underway that are clearly sort of over the next, say, few years plus are going to, when they come to fruition, are going to be outside of the areas that we're targeting. So uh, has there been thought or any sort of ideas on how we kind of rectify more immediately to overcompensate for that uh, imbalance that is pretty much locked into existing longer term capital improvement projects uh, for the immediate to midterm future. So that's, a, that's another fantastic question. Thank you for, for opening that, that conversation. Uh, what, what I'm hearing is that there's such a long history of, of inequitable investment that bringing things just back up to even doesn't actually make it right. There, there, there's still this long history of inequity that, that, that hasn't been accounted for, uh, and 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 we share that perspective and we share that 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 value. That's gonna that's gonna take time. That's gonna take sustained effort. Uh, I think to to continue right sizing and can, and to continue rebalancing. Um, we're again we're we're encouraged by the results that we saw this year, but we're not declaring victory or mission accomplished. Uh, we we want to continue. We want to we want to mark the things that worked well here this year, and we and we want to continue to look for for ways that we can improve. Uh, that process going forward. And, and one thing I, I would be curious to, to hear from, from, from this group about as well is what you'd like to see in a longer term process. Um, you know, we, we're, we're, we're here as part of a, a two year cycle. Uh, and, and as we know, a lot of capital projects have these very long, uh, long lifespans. It takes a little longer than two years to deliver a lot of projects. Um, so we're, we're doing some thinking now about how we can make sure that the community's voice and in particular, um, you know, the underser our, our underserved community's voices are, are represented in that longer term thinking. Th thank you for that, Sean. Uh, consider, I will consider that an uh, invitation to everyone on the line to provide feedback. You can email my office, district six, district, the number six at oaklandca.gov for responses to that question. We can make sure that they get processed. The other thing that I just want to lift up is that I was personally disappointed that 
the rain, the, sorry, the Arroyo Viejo rec center uh, improvement project did not get, uh, I guess, elevated above the line in terms of the approvals. And so that's one that I will be uh, pushing for with my colleagues so that we can get some sort of funding to help move that forward as opposed to it simply staying stagnant for okay. another two years and hoping that it raises uh, above the threshold next year. So uh, I just wanted to, uh, uh, sorry, I see Denise, you're raising your hand. Yeah, uh, I don't have a raised hand function, so I just thought I'd do it actually. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I could uh, address some of those. Um, so I, you know, I definitely, you know, hear the community and that, yeah, by no means as Sean um, mentioned, uh, you know, are we going, it'll, it'll still take time to um, work on the equity, but um, I do want to um, uh, note uh, about some of the projects that were um, completed prior in District 6 that did receive, um, you know, uh, substantial funding from Measure KK, particularly as that's our uh, main funding source, um, you know, with the Rainbow Recreation Center, 5 million. Um, there's been some Head Start uh, at Arroyo Remodel funding, Arroyo V Hill Rec Center renovation itself, 3 million, which is considered um, seed funding. And so uh, while we are um, just um, preparing to uh, do a consultant selection process for that, um, you know, that is uh, money, three million to start that process to get it through design through the community process. And then um, for future funding, um, you know, can be presented um, possibly in the next uh, funding cycle. Um, we um, had not, uh, it would not have been ready for this budget cycle to have even more funding allocated to it yet. And additionally, um, you know, in looking at the Measure KK balance, uh, there was uh, very little left left in the OPR bucket. Um, and so, um, you know, hopefully in the future, we'll be able to pursue grants for Arroyo um, and as well as, you know, have a, a future funding source uh, for it. Um, and I heard mentioned earlier on about the Digital Arts and Culinary Academy, which you had mentioned. Um, I am the project manager for that. Um, and yes, we are uh, in the process of design. We just recently went for a Park and Recreation Advisory Commission approval um, just this past week. And we were also able to secure um, an additional $800,000. So uh, for that project through a uh, CIP development impact fee fund. And so, um, you know, be looking uh, for that as well. Thank, thank you for that uh, update, Denise. Um, I see, let's see, next in the queue. Lauren, Go ahead. Uh, can, can, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, I, I, I know there's multiple people listening, but I, I think that the, the, the last piece for District 6 is safety. And I know the, um, um, the uh, the they're doing an infrastructure on, on the top of the building um, level four, I think, for seven million dollars for the violence prevention um, department. When are we going to? And they got some other millions of dollars funding uh, prior on the previous cycle. When are we guys going to start seeing some um, actual uh, impact from from that tangible? You're talking about the Department of Violence Prevention that uh, is in place and, and you're asking when we will see the impact of the investments in the Department of Violence Prevention? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, sir. Thank you, that's okay. my last question. Um, so what I can, uh, and so I'll quickly address that and then we'll uh, switch to others. What I can say relative to the Department of Violence Prevention is I know that they're having an impact now. I am seeing with the limited uh, sort of uh, staffing and investment that they have had. Uh, one of the challenges with violence prevention is that uh, it is very hands-on. Um, and if you don't see the violence, it's hard to know what you have prevented, right? Um, and so it's one of those, ha ha uh, especially for those who are not involved in violence. Uh, and if you're just looking at overall macro numbers, but I do know that 
when working with the partners that they work with who are on the street uh, and the interactions that they're having with those who have been recently been involved in crimes that are attempting to um, sort of reduce the retaliations and other sort of follow-up, they are a critical part of the uh, the strategy. They are now working, uh, the Var Department of Violence Prevention is working with our police department to have what's called the triangular response to violent crimes, where not just police, but DVP and community violence interrupters are all coming to respond to address the needs and attempt to, um, in a more holistic way, uh, prevent that cycle of amplification of the violence that's happening on the streets. Is it enough? No, I think that's one of the reasons why the um, Reimagining Public Safety Task Force elevated the desire for us to invest more heavily into uh, violence prevention responses. Uh, so I think, and the other thing is as they've been up and running, I think Chief Cespedes, the new chief of the DVP uh, department has been in place for a year and a half. And so we're uh, at the point where they've got their foundational um, plan and strategy. They are getting folks aligned around that. And I think what you're looking for in terms of like measurement results or case studies or, or proof points in that piece are part of the, 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 the building of the infrastructure around violence prevention that's there. So definitely understand that we want to make sure that we are getting the value that is intended. And that is something that I'm fully focused on. And I think everyone is as well. Uh, but there are some wins that we can certainly point to on an individual basis. Um, one of the questions that came up related to that is around ceasefire and the ceasefire budget. Has that been uh, impacted and in, in, increased or improved? I'm not sure if someone from finance can speak to that aspect because, uh, and I, I'm sorry, I can't find where in the chat it came up, but someone had mentioned how they believe in ceasefire and understand its effectiveness and wanna make sure that we aren't uh, shortchanging the direct interventions that have proven successful. Councilmember Taylor, can you unmute Brad? Yep, I'm trying right now. Councilor Taylor, uh, I'm unmuted. Uh, can you say, can you repeat the question one more time? The, I did the, want to re the, the questions about ceasefire as a uh, yeah. crime prevention strategy Absolutely. is how is it being supported, invested? Has what has changed with respect to ceasefire in this budget? So there are no reductions to ceasefire in this in this budget. The budget um, goes out of its way to maintain funding for the violence prevention uh, element of ceasefire, which is housed in DVP by. Uh, Backfilling uh, what would be a reduction in Measure Z funding uh, with general purpose fund funding. Uh, also, the ceasefire division he is not reducing the budget. The ceasefire is preserved entirely and whole to continue doing the work it's doing. So, um, DVT also has a couple of new investments, including uh, uh, a gender-based violence uh, uh, program analyst to help with that particular work and. Are some money that may be leveraged for ceasefire related efforts uh, sort of at the discretion and as the chief plans it out uh, in year one of the budget. So, no effects, no uh, negative effects to ceasefire in this budget whatsoever. Thank you. Brad, since your audio is better um, now, I'm going to also yeah. reflect the question that was raised, uh, just validating it. Someone mentioned that in the budget uh, on online format, they show they're seeing an increase in the budget allocated to- uh, Absolutely, let me, I, I absolutely want to clarify that. Thank you, thank you for the opportunity to do that. So a couple of different ways to look at the budget. Yes, the, the police budget compared to the mid-cycle budget is increased. However, that in the, however, the police budget compared to the 1920 actuals is actually falling. So the budget is, the budget for the o, for OPD proposed in the first year of the budget is higher than the mid-cycle, but lower than what was actually spent in the most recently audited fiscal year. In addition, the police percentage of the total budget has fallen slightly. Those are a couple of different ways of kind of viewing that same information. 
So yes, it has increased. Uh, no, it has not increased relatively faster than everything else on average. Um, and it is still less than the prior year actual. Okay, thank you for clarifying that because uh, someone had raised that in the question. I'm gonna go to the next hand in the queue, Sadeep Ray, uh, asking you to unmute so that you can uh, ask your question. Um, hi, thanks, Lauren. I have two questions. One is regarding the presentation that Sean did on PWD and um, uh, Department of Transportation. Um, I question the data that comes out of this kind of feedback survey. Uh, it seems like it's geared toward our bias towards downtown. I'm surprised that a business corridor has so many communities that they are filling up all these requests and D6 and D7. Uh, if you see the graph, it's very less, right? So even though we put up, you know, equity scoring system and whatnot, that gets trumped by the number of requests coming in. So if if this is how the pattern is going to be, and I've been seeing this for the last two years, even in OPD projects that we are running, uh, downtown gets the biggest share, even though they have the lower crime than D6 and D7 combined. So I'm I'm questioning the way we collect this data and feedback because I feel like, D6 and D7, the outreach is uh, zero. I think the only outreach we get is from your office. So uh, if we don't have the outreach and I want to know how our, what's the source of this uh, feedback forms, right? Who is actually requesting? Is it, what community do we actually talk about? Is it business community or the resident community? So I feel like that the whole data collection is biased because we are not getting the fair share of the projects that we need to run in D6 and D7. Second is the DVP, right? Um, as you said, right, you want to find um, whatever the savings are to violence prevention. But then if you see the Major Z report in its associate meeting, we're not making any progress for the last three years. So throwing money at a problem is not a solution. We need to have a proper matrix that this money is not going to nonprofits, it's actually going to the people who need the help, right? We have so, so many nonprofits and the DVP programs um, I, 77 percent of the money is consumed by those nonprofit. I want to see the people of Oakland, D6 and D7 people, folks, actually getting the benefit of this dollar value. The second is we, you know, the last question would be equity. We talk about equity, um, like right and left, but I want to see dollar by dollar comparison. Um, how much D1 is getting, D2, uh, you know, all the districts are getting in this uh, finance cycles. Uh, so we can have a clear picture that D6 is getting this much from this bucket, uh, whatever the source of funding is, uh, then that that actually gives a true picture of dollar value that D6 and D7 is receiving. Thank you for that, Sadeep. Um, Sean, I know you guys put together a, a table. Um, I'm not quite sure if you want to bring that back up relative to CIP allocation and or the uh, District 6 uh, participation in or sorry east oakland uh, participation in the survey but i i think there's a lot of uh nuggets in what sadeep is saying that are accurate and uh, we do need to continue to keep a very focused um sort of lens and analysis on that and i'll just lift up that for for me i have been hounding on staff about the performance management metrics dashboarding so that we can really review and evaluate how this is happening and put in place the infrastructure to do that on a regular basis, as opposed to it taking nine months for a report to come out that does that analysis. And since it takes so long as it's so burdensome, we don't actually get that feedback loop on a regular basis. Um, Sean, Anything to, uh, to to add relative to what's there? Yeah, and, and, and again, I appreciate these questions. Um, we, we we definitely need to keep as, as much as staff is is, uh, is excited and, and and sincere in our in our uh, commitment to to long term equity and, and to demonstrating uh, demonstrating that that value over time. Uh, having the pressure on from our community always helps. Um, two quick points I would I would um, I would point out um, the 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 scoring of projects itself the scoring uh, the scorecard the, the the prioritization matrix doesn't distinguish by by council district uh, so if we're getting more requests in 
uh, from from say downtown. That doesn't mean that the projects there are going to are going to score better because a lot of people requested them or because they came from residents in a different area. Uh, the, the the equity uh, prioritization factor is geographically based and does uh, do, does pr does prefer uh, investments in East Oakland and West Oakland. Um, so so that's that's kind of one piece of it. The other is 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 where the requests are coming from and, and he, he touched on a really important point that representation there still matters quite a bit and again that's part of why in in this current cycle uh we shifted our our community engagement efforts uh and really focused again east of 66th and south of 580. Uh, i'm seeing comments in the chat that some folks still only heard about the process from the council member's office and we know that that the, establishing those relationships and establishing stronger communication is going to going to take sustained effort and, and we're here to we're here to commit to that. Thank you for that, Sean. I will um, also acknowledge the fact that um, when it comes to this as the 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 equity, these aspects that we're talking about, um, I am going to continue to push and fight for that. And uh, it is a partnership, so I encourage you guys on the line to continue working with me, working through your neighborhood council, so that we can aggregate our voice in a way that actually does lift up and amplify and 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 push that uh the in addition to these uh measures that you know administration is taking i did want to acknowledge i see a few hand a, a few different times the comment was made about uh opd overtime and how an individual officer can make a significant amount of overtime uh, one thing that has been in discussion and that I am supportive of is capping the amount of overtime that an individual officer can make because uh, there, there, there shouldn't be like, okay, an officer works 360 days out of the year, like that um, a level of um, sort of one officer going there is, uh, I think, a concern. And the other piece is when it comes to I think any employee working that much is not good because it uh, limits their ability to be effective. But the other piece um, is with the more accurate assessment of what the overtime should be across the entire department, we can hold our uh, department accountable to not going above it. And so by getting a more accurate overtime estimate, we can then say there is a strong hard line not to exceed say 5% uh, above X, Y, or Z. And so uh, those are things that I'm supportive of that I put into the, the the budget sort of process last year as a policy to begin exploring and we'll continue to push on that. Um, next in the queue, I think we had, I, I see your hand Keisha, but I'm gonna go to Ms. Sterling because she hasn't had a chance to ask anything. So Ms. Sterling, I'm going to unmute you and hopefully you'll be able to, or ask you to unmute, hopefully you can, uh, make your comment or question. Ms. Sterling, are you there? You'll just need to unmute. Okay, I've asked her to unmute. Maybe we'll go to, while she's not able to, we'll go to Adolphus. I know you've been there for a while asking you to unmute. Hello, how you doing? This is Adolphus Morgan. Doing well. And I'm a District 6, six resident. I have a question about the capital improvement monies that was allocated. Um, Suda and um, Jose also, we all live in the same block and money was allocated for um, traffic um, control uh, last quarter in 2020, and yet no work has been started on, on that particular project. And I'm just wondering when it was going to start. I heard your capital improvement um, verbiage, but I was I didn't know the um, the acronyms you had given if it if it, if it uh, applied to where I live. Yep. Uh, thanks for that, Adolphus. Um, I'm I'm not quite sure if folks are ready to reply, but I did. Um, I have been in constant communication relative to the MacArthur corridor and the NAE. Nay Avenue corridor. My understanding is that the um, after the paving that has already been completed on MacArthur, right there between 73rd and 82nd, uh, 82nd um, we are going to be at the end of the summer installing the um, the mitigation, uh, some of the mitigation uh, um, 
efforts and then the hard concrete work. Uh, so sort of the lighter non sort of rigid concrete work is going to happen at the end of the summer. And then the hard concrete work in terms of the medians uh, and that, you know, slow things down and create the turning lanes that's going to be uh, in 2022. So the earlier part of 2022. Um, relative uh, I was just going to say relative to the Nay Avenue uh, safety uh, improvements that are laid out, that is part of the CIP proposal uh, within the neighborhood traffic safety program. And so that's where within that list, you'll see neighborhood sa traffic safety program. And what has been confirmed to me is that the Nay Avenue effort is the division's higher priority for implementation. Okay, one other question I've also uh, is concerning the cameras that were people have been talking about in the neighborhood for it's putting cam cameras for the crime control. Is that a hard idea or just a conversation? So I have lifted up what, what I'll say is that as far as cameras, there are uh, so cameras are, are, are tricky because of the privacy uh, concerns relative to the, to the government city of Oakland having cameras everywhere that does surveillance, the concerns with Big Brother and abuse of that. But uh, what is happening and uh, is being encouraged and I am very supportive of is supporting uh, private, both residential and commercial properties having cameras and, and, and then they control uh, the use of those cameras to provide safety. They control when that's shared with uh, OPD and sort of the public safety professionals and so that is something that I'm advocating for us investing in is being able to help those who are unable to afford the uh, camera systems, similar to how my colleagues have advocated for cameras to go into Chinatown and sort of invest uh, there given recent activities. We should be, from my standpoint, investing as a city to support the placement of uh, security surveillance cameras uh, into corridors, business, commercial corridors that we have in East Oakland that may not have all of the resources that you have in other parts of the city like Rockridge, Montclair, et cetera. Thank you. Great. Uh, Ms. Sterling, are you there and able to unmute? I think she's still not, uh, not available. Um, okay. With that, uh, I'll go to my team, District 6 team or others who are monitoring the chat. Are there other questions that have not been raised, asked, answered that we need to lift up? None that I see on Facebook. There was one question about parking enforcement revenues, um, but I'm not sure if the finance department will be able to address that. Uh, anyone able to speak about parking enforcement revenues? I think I'm not quite what, sure what the specific angle was, but um, relative to parking enforcement, I know that we have concerns that are raised uh, in terms of not for street sweeping. We don't, I know some re recent concerns about not getting the street sweeping out in our uh, area. And when it does come, there's no enforcement of people moving their, their vehicles so that we can actually get to the curb and keep our uh, keep East Oakland cleaner. Uh, that's one thing I think it has been raised about parking enforcement uh, revenues and how they uh, support the Get there, parking enforcement officers. Brad, I heard you a little bit, not sure if that was intentional. Yeah, I was just going to add, Councilmember Taylor, uh, if the question is about our trend on parking related revenues, I think. Uh, our revenue and tax minister may have alluded to that that is one of the most uh, affected categories of our revenues by the pandemic. We've seen a lot less parking in especially our downtown area, which is uh, and at the airport, which has led to a really strong decrease in parking tax revenues. That's the primary reason for the decline in revenue for Measure Z, because that's also partly funded by parking tax. We also collect parking uh, revenues from the actual meters that points go into them. Those are down or current credit cards, and then obviously the citation revenue, which is from enforcement, was also down, that is somewhat recovered because of the return of uh, enforcement of our zones and uh, the uh, parking enforcement around street sweeping, which I think you were just alluding to earlier. Uh, those revenues are in the general purpose fund, 
and uh, is where they end up at the end of the day. So I'm not sure if that answers the question or what the question was, but hopefully that's some background. Hey, thank you for that, Brad. Um, recognizing that we are over time, it's now 12.11, we had billed to go until 12 o'clock. And I know that we still have some questions in the uh, hands that are raised. I'm going to invite those who have unanswered questions to reach out to my office uh, via email, district6 at oaklandca.gov. You can also reach out to uh, me directly. Uh, my email address is ltaylor at oaklandca.gov. We will make sure to get your questions answered. We'll go through the chat. We will be posting this video online for those who are unable to make it. And uh, I look forward to continuing to advocate for you on your behalf for the rest of District 6 and all of Oakland as we attempt to live into our potential, uh, both individually and collectively. Thank you everyone for your time today.